We're going to be um, talking in this session about what the UK can do um, without an EU agreement in terms of what are uh, WTO uh, you know, rules on this area and particularly the unilateral pillar that, that, that Lockwood and I just talked about. What can we do unilaterally um, to improve our, our, our economic environment in the UK and how does the WTO framework that underpins all of trade and all of our relationships, and will continue to underpin all of our relationships, no matter what arrangement we come to with the European Union. I have on the panel, um, uh, starting with my far left, Francisco Sanchez. Um, all of these gentlemen, by the way, are, are, are part of our Legatum Institute Special Trade Commission. Francisco was the lead US negotiator in the Department of Commerce, Under Secretary for International Trade in the Obama administration. Um, on, uh, my, on his right is Razin Sally, Dr. Razin Sally with the National University of Singapore, is a leading uh, trade economist. And right next to me on my left here is Alden Abbott, who was the uh, director in the International Affairs Division of the Federal Trade Commission um, and, and is now with the, with the Heritage Foundation in, in Washington. Um, so I'm going to start, uh, Razin, with you. Um, and ask you to talk about what, what does the UK uh, look like? What can we do under that unilateral um, pillar to improve our own environment? And how, how does that impact the negotiation we have with the EU? Yes, um, well, I mean, let, 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 let me build on, on your comments and uh, Sir Lockwood's sort of vigorous uh, defense of unilateral li liberalization earlier. Uh, now, you started out talking about four pillars, Shankar, and of course they're very much connected. Three of them are about reciprocity. They're about negotiations, they're about trade agreements, they're about mutual concessions. But the first pillar is uh, what I always say in lectures is the Nike strategy. You just do it, exclamation mark. You don't wait for your trade negotiations. Uh, because the gains accrue from imports, from inward investment and what have you. Now, for 44 years, Britain has not been able to do that. Uh, it did that in the 19th century, famously. Britain led the world with unilateral free trade. Uh, from the 1840s through the uh, repeal of the Corn Laws, the great Gladstone budgets of the 1850s. And, uh, as was pointed out in the last panel, there are stellar examples from New Zealand, Australia, Chile, uh, Estonia, and other Eastern European countries of using unilateral liberalization as the motor of trade opening and of a transformation of the economy uh, from the 1980s in the through the 1990s to the last decade. So, uh, my basic point is, is this. Uh, and it's an existential point. If we are to chart a more liberal course outside the European Union, and without that, there really was no point in leaving, then this unilateral pillar is at least as important as the other three pillars. And in my book, it's probably the most important. Uh, because, back to that existentialism, if we have a weak unilateral pillar, then we are going to have a less liberal future outside the European Union and a less prosperous future. With a strong one, quite the reverse. So what does, what does that mean in more concrete terms? It's a combination of direct trade liberalization and essentially a domestic competitiveness agenda. And the two must be thought of as Siamese twins. So we are talking about an overall agenda for national competitiveness, which has a trade component, but it must be linked very strongly to domestic regulatory reform. I'm going to talk mainly about the trade component. Alden and, and Francisco perhaps will concentrate more on, 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 the, on the other stuff. Now that trade component, uh, one can divide into, uh, in, into three groups. It's in industry, it's agriculture and it's services. Services being the most complicated. So let's start with non-agricultural goods, manufacturing goods. Now, we have the chance, once we leave the customs union, to unilaterally reduce and remove our tariffs. Uh, and we should take advantage of that. My view is that we should be bold about this. 
Now, there are a lot of tariffs that are of nuisance value, as Shankar mentioned earlier. Uh, those we should remove as quickly as possible, and when the time is right, we should announce a timetable. There are intermediate tariffs that are important for global value chains. They can be taken down. But I would actually go further. We have a few tariffs that are actually quite significant on cars, on uh, textiles, clothing and footwear, a few other products. I think we could send a great message to the world out there, as the New Zealanders did in the 1980s, as the Chileans did in the 1970s, as the Estonians did in the 1990s, by saying that we in Britain, for the first time since the mid-19th century, are going all the way to unilateral free trade on industrial goods. In other words, all industrial tariffs go down to zero over an announced timetable. And it's not going to cost us that much politically because manufacturing is a relatively small part of the economy. There will be a few sensitive sectors with predictable lobbying. But I think the prize is out there and it would be a fantastic signaling mechanism to show that Britain is truly open for business by being fully open to the world on industrial products. What about agriculture, uh, the, second, the second group? Now, agriculture is politically more sensitive. Uh, there are higher levels of protection, not least uh, in the EU, uh, that British farmers will have to face. Uh, it's also a much smaller part of the economy. So one could argue on politically expedient grounds, we can't go as far on agriculture, but we still have room to reduce our tariffs and quotas, particularly in areas where we don't have any domestic production. Much of the rest we can negotiate away over time, through our new free trade agreements. Services is probably the most important in the medium to long term because it's 80% of the economy. It's the bulk of our exports. It dwarfs what we export in terms of manufacturers. Uh, it's going to be the most difficult and the most challenging because we are wedded for the moment, for a while, to EU standards through the ACI, which essentially govern our services regulation. That will continue until Brexit. It will probably continue for the most part until we negotiate an ultimate free trade agreement with the EU. The EU is going to insist on that. Uh, but we have to be very strategic about this. If we are not careful very easily, we are going to be wedded to EU regulation on services, not just until the end of Brexit and until the end of the following transition period, but beyond that as well. In other words, there's going to be not much change. We're not going to have much regulatory reform domestically. We're not going to be in a position to negotiate strong free trade agreements with the Americans, the Australians, the New Zealanders, and others. What does, it, what does strategy mean? Well, we're, we are about to have this great repeal bill, which is actually the great acquisition bill, because it's about transposing EU regulation into UK law. There's a two-step procedure which we should think about. Firstly, while we will have to transpose most of this stuff temporarily, some of it we can probably not apply. Uh, and we'll have to identify what those areas are. Most of the rest we will have to apply for a while, hopefully for not too long, but then we should think strategically and identify what areas we will, going to, we will keep in order to be roughly in conformity with what the EU has, and what areas where we can deregulate beyond the EU uh, in a whole host of regulations on standards for products, for processes, and for services. So in the medium term, we can think about unilateral deregulation of services in addition to the services deregulation that will come through new free trade agreements. So th that's what I think should be done on those three areas. It, the, 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 the groups don't stop there. Uh, we have to have a fairly liberal migration policy uh, that won't be music to the ears of some Brexiters because without that, a lot of the gains from the other stuff will not be realized. Uh, we need to have a policy of first doing no harm when it comes to industrial policy on manufacturers, for example, on corporate takeovers and subsidies for manufacturing. That's outdated industrial policy. Uh, 
That's not sensible 21st century industrial policy. And we need a whole host of new principles to apply to domestic regulation, which the others on the panel are going to talk about. Thank you. Thank you. So, Alden, um, you've spent your entire career on the on, on this sort of interface between competition and regulatory uh, issues, and ha how how can we deliver that pro-competitive regulatory environment at home? Um, there are some examples around the world. Um, uh, we just heard from New Zealand, which you know integrated pretty well its competition agency into the domestic regulatory process. Uh, can you just sort of outline your thoughts on, on how we might deliver um, that aspect of this um, process? Right. Well, well, fortunately, there are some good examples about how to tackle major regulatory change that uh, speeds up economic growth. There's a, a New Zealand, but New Zealand has a permanent uh, productivity commission, which uh, is a, an advisory body, but it advises the government and looks Regular, regularly at existing industries and, and potential barriers and advises which ones are not cost beneficial, have, have cost to the economy that outweigh any benefits. Uh, Australia, which had some sort of similar problems to New Zealand, uh, in 1993 issued a major report and pro special productivity commission identifying all sorts of areas where privatization and deregulation in core industries was possible. Uh, according to uh, recent studies by the ACCC, the Australian uh, uh, Competition Commission, uh, aided by academics, the, inject the did gr growth in GDP, uh, I think, was over 2.5% uh, higher, Australian GDP, than it would have been absent those changes, and that was uh, widely viewed as a very conservative estimate. And as we've already heard from, I think, New Zealand, uh, Sir Sir Lockwood, probably these estimates uh, uh, understate the benefits. So Australia, New Zealand is, as was noted, uh, arguably the, the number one, or certainly one of, one of top two or three nations for ease of doing business. Australia is, 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 is quite up there. So again, institutionalizing, what do you do? Now, now Britain has, Competition Markets Authority, which does sort of industry uh, uh, studies, but, but uh, totally apart from that, it might look at establishing a mechanism, as was noted, once you have ported over into UK law these uh, European laws, you, you could have existing regulations quickly reviewed. US has a mechanism uh, under Central White House Office of Management and Budget to review all proposed regulations on cost uh, major, that have major economic impact, and uh, there's a head of that uh, unit uh, is able to really block or order agencies to change regulations that are not cost beneficial. Now, some have argued that despite that, regulations have grown because there have been political pressures uh, to find <laughs> that regulations are cost beneficial. Nevertheless, it's a major uh, agency, and uh, that principle, one can certainly imagine, you know, perhaps with help from economists from the CMA, but one could imagine some sort of cabinet level review, perhaps attached to the Prime Minister's Office of Regulations. The United States also uh, enacted 20 years ago a, a law which was not much used called Congressional Review Act that allowed Congress to overturn under an expedited up or, up or down vote, recently enacted uh, regulations by, by the uh, agencies. That uh, now has been applied, and I won't get into the politics of it, but it's been applied over a dozen times just in the last two months, and it may have application to older regulations as well. So what I'm getting at, it, it's quite possible to, uh, with a few good economists, I think, to look at the major regulatory obstacles uh, sort of that remain in, in the European legislation that's been ported over and said, look, on a going forward basis, which one of these? Uh, you may not be able to look at all of them. You have to use uh, your uh, limited resources, but you can say which ones have the greatest negative cost-benefit effects on the UK economy and could gr most greatly promote liberalization of the U UK economy. Uh, so again, I, I think the Australian-New Zealand examples 
those two countries have permanent advisory commissions that continue to look at the economy and identify potential barriers to economic freedom. There's this sort of reg regulatory view concept in the United States, and there are some very fine uh, economists at, at the Competition Markets Authority. Uh, I know it was, uh, another good source, source of, of advice, uh, Sir John Vickers, who's uh, a warden of all souls and former head of the uh, Office of Fair Trading in, in the UK, might, might be the sort of person you'd call upon if you wanted to set up s some sort of system of, of this sort. Uh, I'd, uh, so I, I think this is all very doable and, um, and holds out some real process. Uh, and prospects for, for uh, economic growth. One last thing I'll mention quickly. Uh, the mention was made of standards. One reason that there was a lot, lack of enthusiasm for a, a U.S. Uh, trade, a proposed trade and investment agreement uh, between the European Union and the U.S. was a concern in the United States that European standards, which were very much government ad advisory led and influenced, were very clumsy and, and anti-competitive and would tend to retard economic growth versus sort of uh, bottom-up uh, standards. So you should really look, and I think in the area of standard setting, the United States really took the lead in standards in, in, in telecoms, certainly in mobile phones, precisely because, one, I would argue, you had that sort of liberal approach, bottom-up bottom up competition among potential standards. And that's sort of been, if not antithetical, not really consistent with a more centralized, dirigiste sort of European approach. So that standards is certainly an area where I think the UK economy could, could, could benefit uh, greatly. And sort of a mutual recognition regime is, uh, might be something to look at. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to come back to you on that question of, of, of standards and regulatory issues because in order to, to come up with an agreement with Europe that's consistent with the other agreements we want to have with other countries around the world, um, we, know we have to ask ourselves, why do we want regulatory flexibility? What's the point of regulatory flexibility? And that's really about uh, growing the market, consumer welfare, and, and, and so on. But Francisco, you were in the US government, and you were negotiating trade um, uh, in the Obama administration, dur during which a number of trade agreements were, were concluded, and during which the TPP process was advanced and, and concluded, uh, at least for that time. Um, uh, can you talk about the, the WTO platform? Because we hear a lot about, you know, crashing out on WTO standards. Um, but the WTO is a platform. It is the, the foundation of the international trading system that we have. Um, talk about how the WTO platform fits into regional trade agreements and, and, and how Britain can benefit from, from its position in the WTO. Well, thank you, Shanker. It's a pleasure to be here with my distinguished colleagues. Um, I, would, I would say, Razine mentioned that the, of the four pillars we've been talking about all morning, that the unilateral pillar is perhaps the, more, the most important. Um, and if that's true, and I believe that it is, um, the fourth pillar, uh, multi, multilateral, which is really what, when we talk about the WTO, that's what we're talking about, is, as you say, it's the foundation. Uh, much of, or if not everything, flows from that. Um, and <clears throat> it has provided stability, the WTO has, in terms of promoting uh, free trade around the world, but in many ways it has also been stalled. We haven't seen uh, a, signi a significant agreement come out of the WTO in about 20 years. Uh, Sir Lockwood Smith mentioned the important voice that the UK can have going forward uh, in, in trade generally, but I would say in the WTO specifically. And as I think about these four pillars, uh, they're all interrelated with the WTO forming the foundation. Um, and so one of the things that I think that the UK can do through the WTO is pr uh, provide a strong voice. Um, and it may be beginning with uh, focusing on, on services, for example and getting uh, other countries together to begin discussions, not necessarily full-blown agreements, but let's begin conversations. Um, and as the UK thinks about these four <coughs> pillars, um, I think it's important to think about sequencing and prioritizing. I know in, in my country now, uh, the Trump administration 
uh, got rid of the TPP and says we're going to do a lot of bilateral agreements. Well, one concern I have uh, on that is the last three bilateral agreements we took took a long time. Colombia, from the initiation of the negotiations to ratification and implementation, took over seven years. Um, I can't remember exactly how long South Korea and Panama took, but they took a long time. Um, the UK has some platforms that they can draw from. Uh, TPP, while its future is uncertain, though I've heard some optimistic comments uh, throughout the morning, at a minimum, uh, it is a good uh, starting point to think about uh, a prosperity uh, uh, trade agreement among like-minded nations. So um, my, uh, my recommendation to the UK is that it take an active role in the WTO um, in helping do uh, a big part of what the WTO was intended to do, which is to promote rules-based free trade. It does that well in some instances. In others, it needs help, and I think the UK can play an important role, number one. Number two, as, we pri as the UK prioritizes where it's going to spend its time in terms of negotiations, certainly uh, uh, first order of agenda is, uh, is the relationship between the UK and uh, the EU. But I would urge the UK to simultaneously begin conversations with other nations uh, that it wants to uh, move forward with free trade agreements. Because as my panelists and Rosine, I think you in particular said, uh, if, you, if you bind yourself with the EU in certain ways um, that tie your hands in other negotiations, I think you're going to shortchange the opportunities that are out there. So I think you have to, you have to walk and chew gum at the same time. You're going to have to be able to move forward um, uh, with the EU. But at the same time, not necessarily formal negotiations, but at least engage in conversations. There's talk about a, a, a potential free trade agreement uh, with the US. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be some time away, in part because you've got business to take care of here, um, and in part because you need, the United States needs to figure out what its trade policy is. It seems to be shifting uh, on a daily, um, or at least a weekly uh, basis. But those conversations should begin now. Uh, my colleague from Canada mentioned earlier that uh, it might be useful to think about a relationship with not only the United States, but a relationship with Canada, Mexico, and the United States. And I would agree with that, uh, because I, I'm a believer that if you've got a good platform to begin with, you're going to make more progress doing uh, multilateral or, or plurilateral agreements than doing a lot of bilaterals. So I, I, these are just basic process points I think we need to keep in mind. We, we want to do a lot of things, and our pillars have a lot in there. But as it relates to bilateral and plurilateral agreements, um, I, would, I would favor looking at what we can do with multiple countries. Um, and I would favor starting at a minimum early discussions, perhaps within a WTO context, as we do the work that needs to be done, or as you do the work that needs to be done um, I'm, I'm American, but I've already co-opted uh, myself into the, into the UK. Um, as, as you do the work that needs to be done with the EU. Thank you. Um, we actually have some time for questions, and I know we ha haven't had a lot of time for questions this morning, so, um, so I'm going to go to the audience. I think there's a microphone um, coming. If I can have this one gentleman here. And, um, do we have a microphone? Thank you. My name is David Howard. Um, three very quick points. First, uh, uh, I love your four pillars. I just want to put some cross beams across the top of okay. them. One, uh, services. Absolutely right that uh, this is service economy. Service is the expanding area. McKinsey says more earnings are coming from service and data and information trade than from manufactured goods in the world now. So it's the bigger half and growing. So. Where, how do we define the areas where services expansion is really going to work for us? It's going to be the like-minded countries, mm -hmm. particularly the English-speaking countries and the Commonwealth Network. Mm -hmm. uh, Europe has been all right for services, but there's so many national, not just EU, national mm -hmm. obstacles we have to break through all those. So it's like-minded and so. Secondly, 
capital flows. This country lives by a huge capital flow in inflows to finance our trade deficit and buy dividends from our external stuff. So we have to go, I don't think it's too sensible just to talk about trade without talking about the huge growth of capital flows both ways and how we maximize that in uh, any arrangements with the EU or with the wider world. And thirdly, if we're going to influence things in the WTO, there's something very big happening in the WTO which we have to accept which is a China-led yeah. aim to build up a parallel system of world institutions, not to take on the rules-based order of the Atlantic world, but really to run in parallel with it. And we have to, in Britain, we have to liaise very closely with and influence and work with all the countries of the so-called developing world, China-led, but also, again, the Commonwealth Network, uh, in order to have a big impact in the WTO. Otherwise, we'll find ourselves swept along by other people setting the pace, as China is already doing. Mm. So three observations, mm. turn them into questions. Okay, I, I'm gonna go to the panel on that, but, but first on your last point. I think this is an incredibly important point, and we, we sort of lose sight of this. We sort of look very much at the Brexit sort of situation through our own lens, but really this is the background of this, is there is in the world, there are two essentially competing models. There's a state-led economic model, which China is, is championing and doing quite a good job of of spreading around the world. And then there's a sort of competitive markets model which historically the West has, has embraced. And, and we're losing this battle, as you pointed out. And this whole Brexit process and what we're doing, our full pillared strategy, what other countries are doing, you know, I agree with you, should be looked at through, through that lens. And the Commonwealth, I think, also plays an important role as an alignment of values. Um, that there is the, the advantage of the Commonwealth is its divergence, uh, frankly. I mean, there is a Commonwealth member in almost every grouping around the world, um, and there is an alignment there that could be helpful in this process. But let me turn your comments and questions to the panel. I'll just go from Alden uh, down the, the line. Uh, no, I, I, I think that's important, tying in with I, which I talked about a little bit, the unilateral pillar. I think one way to try and convince uh, nations that it's worth, you know, pursuing plurilateral agreements, whether variations on existing agreements or new, or new ones with the UK, sort of to lead, lead by example. One thing we didn't have time to mention, but Shanker and I did some work on, on one of the real impediments to economic growth uh, that's behind, behind the border uh, economic distortions created by regulations that artificially raise costs for new uh, competitors trying to enter. And there, there are ways of looking at that. And to the extent that the UK could look at reducing these sort of cost uh, raising distortions, uh, that is, that's a big problem, I think, in many countries that have state-led economies in particular. Certainly, uh, uh, India is not China, but there are lots of distortions of that sort in India and also in, in China. So you really have to, I think, <coughs> at some point lead by example. I think it was a particularly interesting example in New Zealand that couldn't make decent wine until it boldly led by example and took aggressive steps. Perhaps by a, by a broad regulatory reform measure, uh, you could in effect, if that spurred rapid growth, I think the, the Euro, you'd see European Union taking note and also um, certainly other, you know, China and some other nations as well. So that, that's my thought. Thanks, all. Um, let, let, me, let me pick up your point about China and um, uh, essentially rival models of capitalism for writing the rules of the global economy. Now, I mean, I sit in Singapore, um, and uh, what I witness in Asia, particularly with a vacuum left by the United States, by the American withdrawal from the TPP, is China now opportunistically trying to write the rules of the game and others thinking that this is going to lead to inevitable success uh, and that they will just have to adapt accordingly. Uh, many wish otherwise, uh, but wh what might that entail? Uh, firstly, on trade, it, it entails fairly trade light rules that might do something on the tariffs but essentially don't tackle non-tariff and regulatory barriers inside the border on services, on investment, on public procurement, 
on competition rules, on state-owned enterprises, on subsidies, and other things besides. That, plus a lot of Chinese money, which is essentially debt creation uh, for cross-border infrastructure, and the third Chinese pillar is essentially buying up local political and economic elites by hook or by crook, so that individual countries come into the Chinese camp. That is a vision of a very different kind of capitalism in East Asia, spreading to other parts of the world. And that is not our vision in the West, nor is it the vision in other parts of the developing world. Uh, so uh, this is, I think, where Britain has a critical leading role to play for free markets, for limited government, and yes, let's not shy away from this word, for freedom. Uh, and a core part of that is economic freedom. We can set our own example through unilateral liberalization on trade, on foreign investment, on regulatory reform uh, as part of that vision. Uh, we can go for a high standard agreement with the European Union, uh, but perhaps even higher standard agreements with more like-minded countries elsewhere, uh, which reinforce uh, those market-conforming rules. Uh, and on services, that means, to go a little bit more into the detail, uh, essentially operating on a negative list, so everything's on the table except what's specifically exempted, having investor-state dis uh, dispute settlement, uh, making sure that trade in services is aligned with investment for commercial presence, uh, and also aligned with the movement of, of professionals and other workers that are critical to global supply chains. Uh, digital trade, cyber security, all of these new things are important. In other words, trade agreements that are more aligned with the kind of global value chains that have been developing from around, from 1990 roughly to the present and, 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 and beyond. It's a very different world of international trade with very different production networks. It's not just about border barriers, but about behind the border barriers, some of which are on present trade agendas, such as the TPP and NAFTA, and some of the EU agreements, and within the European Union itself, but a lot of stuff that's fairly lightly covered by even these existing agreements. We need a package of policies that are about trade and behind the border competitiveness that reach into areas like intellectual property protection and uh, the ease of doing business, business, all kinds of domestic business climate issues that are genuinely facilitatory of, of, of commerce. Uh, and that's a very different kind of, kind of capitalism. Uh, and that game, it's everything still to play for. It's not inevitably lost. Doesn't mean we shouldn't engage the Chinese along the way. We should. Uh, but at the same time, we are in competition with them when it comes to the rules of the game. Uh, just, just extremely briefly so we can take more questions. I completely agree with your three points on services. Services needs to be at the forefront of all four pillars, whether we're negotiating bilaterally, multilaterally, or we're doing unilateral changes. Uh, with regard to the Chinese, one of the things that was very concerning to me when the United States pulled out of TPP was not only the benefit that would be gained from the 12 countries that negotiated TPP, but the precedential value of that high standard agreement for the rest of the world. And without it, um, as my colleagues have pointed out, the Chinese will uh, come in and fill the vacuum with a different world view of trade. So again, to reiterate what I said earlier, is the UK's voice here is very important in a WTO context and in other ways as well. Okay, we are really out of time, so I'm gonna take three questions together, make them very quick, and, and then we'll go to the panel. So if we start um, with, excuse me, this gentleman here, and then the person behind him, and then, uh, gosh, um, uh, and then over here. Yeah. 
the, the back there. No, the, the bar, find you. I, I'll try and make this a, uh, a question. My name is Peter Marshall. I was a British ambassador in Geneva a few years ago. I'm also the Secretary, Deputy Secretary General of the Commonwealth. The question that, that you're raising, you're absolutely right. We've got to think in terms not simply of trade, but of international involvement as a whole. And that includes the rule of law, the whole concept of collective security, and what we call uh, either influence, goodwill, soft power, or soft soap. Thank you. Uh, Philip Rush from Hedronomics. Uh, so I think there's a, there's a great split today between your sessions, having the WTO rectification, EU uh, side of things this afternoon and, and now the kind of unilateral competitiveness but also the bilateral multilateral bit. My question though is the extent to which the UK is starting with a, with a bank blank slate if you like around that bilateral and multilateral side. We have a lot of trade deals existing through the EU. What are the prospects for grandfathering those things in? Like where are their potential issues? Uh, and to the extent we can grandfather them in does that then uh, become a hurdle to renegotiating something more liberal in the future if you do already have something in place? Thanks. And then, question, and then we'll take. And then after that, we'll um, go to the panel. Yes, uh, my name is David Marsh from OnFIF. Uh, it's a question about vocabulary. Mm -hmm. it, in lots of sessions, not this one, there's lots of talk about cakes and pies and growing and having your cake and eating it and all that stuff, and particularly this uh, thing about uh, not eating cherries, not picking cherries. If, if you speak to the Germans, they say, why shouldn't you pick cherries? You're friends, and that's what they do. It's a question really to Razine, because your name sounds very much like the German, Rosine and pick a high. Why shouldn't you pick cherries at trade negotiations? And why shouldn't we tell the others that's what we're going to do? Okay. So I'm going to just ask the panelists to respond to any of those questions, and then we'll close the uh, we'll close the session. Just on grandfathering, it's it's it, you know it's a it's basically an exchange of notes procedure with a technical modification on those agreements. So you you basically pick the six or seven that are really important, like South Korea, like Switzerland, like Mexico, Canada, etc., and go through that process. But I don't see any problem um, in taking that and ad and advancing that if those countries want to do that. Uh, I don't have anything uh, particular to add. I mean, I do think this idea of, of, of competition of, of systems it, it is important, and that's why I think precisely picking up with Francisco and what uh, Razine said, it, it's very, very important that we be bold, because if, if uh, as I mentioned, if, if UK is not bold, if it uh, does not dismantle major barriers, if it just wants to repli replicate EU, a light version of EU laws without really changing much. It's going to get, it's not going to get real net benefits and it's not going to, it's going to miss a single opportunity to, to play this unusual leadership role. And I think it was mentioned earlier, the, uh, the UK, so the Commonwealth, it has a, a, a transatlantic ties which tied into NAFTA, Canada, Mexico. It's got uh, potentially, uh, you know, the Australia, ties to Australia, New Zealand, to TPP, to East Asian so, so, uh, trade, and because of its historic role as the champion of free trade, which in, in the 19th century, it, it perhaps more than any other nation has this unique ability uh, thrust upon it really to take a lead. Um, d d just a couple of very quick points I mean, to, 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 to your point, sir. Um, uh, of course, trade negotiations can't do everything, uh, and one needs a division of labor uh, among ne negotiations on different sets of issues. All of these issues are related, of course, but uh, your observation prompts me to say that the original argument for free trade is not actually an economic one. It's about international peace. It goes back to an early Christian tradition uh, 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 called the I think they actually called it the universal brotherhood of man. Commerce among nations is one's insurance policy uh, to enable people to get to know each other better and to prevent wars from happening. Of course, this was the major impulse of Richard N uh, Cobden back in, back in the 19th century. That, of course, remains a fundamental argument for freer or free trade because uh, 
the global Pax geopolitics is very much linked to bread and butter, international commerce. Uh, David, vielen Dank für die deutsche Aussprache. Um, I, I first came across David Marsh as a humble student in a bedsit in Frankfurt in the late 1980s when he regularly appeared. <laughs> you, you, were, you were on Frühschoppen, weren't you, with Werner Hofer? So I would see him on television every Sunday morning when he was the FT's uh, correspondent in what was then West Germany. Um, well, uh, ch cherry picking is, of course, uh, fine, fine, David, and uh, we also have to be opportunistic. Uh, but I think the main thing is to, to use words that have cropped up before. We need foundations, we need platforms, and above all, we need strategy uh, before we start to, to, pick, uh, to, pick, to pick cherries. Uh, one, one very final point which hasn't been raised so far, but I think this one is critical. My, my gut feeling is that the biggest political battle in all of this is not our battle with Brussels or with uh, or complicated negotiations with partners uh, across oceans. It's the battle right here. Uh, it's leadership here from the prime minister down, and that of course includes our corporate captains, um, and various opinion formers to convey this message to the British public uh, that if there is to be any point to leaving the European Union and to bear the costs that will come from it, especially the costs from leaving the single market, uh, well, these are the gains out there for prosperity and, yes, freedom, um, and this is what we have to do along the way. Um, now that message has not been conveyed so far. I think many of our leaders still have to formulate their own vision of it. Uh, but it has to happen, and it has to happen fairly quickly. I have nothing to add in response to the, to the questions that were asked. My colleagues did a great job of, of responding. I would just say, I give a, an American perspective to Brexit six to 10 months ago and today. And this is my perspective. Uh, when you voted to leave the European Union, uh, I and probably a lot of people who pay attention to this in the US literally panicked um, and there was fear. And where my opinion has come today is much of what you've heard here is there are real opportunities. And what I would ask you to do is seize the moment. Uh, because there really, really is an opportunity for the UK to prosper and to also positively impact uh, world trade and economic growth around the world.